Dear ladies and gentlemen, Pani Tapanova, this is a ninth episode in the series of conversation and interviews with intellectuals in Ukraine for those out there who are keen to learn more, think deeper, and hear from the original sources. В етері дев'ятий випуск із серії розмов та інтерв'ю з інтелектуалами в Україні для тих, хто хоче дізнатися більше, думати глибше та чути з першого джерел. This is a project of Pan Ukraine who are in Ukraine right now, fighting for their freedom and indeed their bare lives under the continuing Russian invasion. We again and again express our support and admiration for their dedication and commitment, as well as for the indefatigable spirit of all Ukrainians who are fighting for freedom today. Це проєкт українського пену, члени якого зараз перебувають у Україні, борються за свою свободу, а власне і за своє життя під загрозою триваючого вторгнення Росії. Ми в чергове висловлюємо нашу підтримку та захоплення вашою самовідданістю та наполегливістю, а також невтомним духом усіх українців, які боронять нині свою свободу. The project is co-hosted by Pan International, which has continued to provide a platform for freedom of expression for those currently under the highest risk. We are functioning under the Pan Charter. This event is organized with kind support of Goethe Institute Ukraine and our partners for today are Pan America, the Ukrainian Institute, the Ukrainian Institute London, Ukraine World, the Harvard University Ukrainian Research Institute and the Harriman Institute at Columbia University. We are streaming today's event to all partners' Facebook pages. Spiorganizatorom projektu je Mizhnarodny Pan, jaki prodovzhuje nadavati platformu dla svobody vyrženja poglede dla tych, хто зараз перебуває у групі найвищого ризику. Ми діємо за засадами Хартії ПЕН. Захід організовано за підтримки Українського гети інституту Сьогодні нашими партнерами є ПЕН Америка, Український інститут, Український інститут Лондона, Ukraine World, Український науково-дослідний інститут Гарвардського університету та інститут Гаррімана при Колумбійському університеті. Ми транслюємо сьогоднішню подію на всі партнерські сторінки у Фейсбук. Захід відбуватиметься англійською мовою. And I will switch to into English to present our speakers today. Our speakers are those who can put the light on a very fresh context of the ongoing situation we never touched earlier. The state of war as a special mode of social existence and philosophical reflection around it and the role of the West. Our first guest is Alexey Panich, philosopher, translator and public activist senior researcher at Spirit and Letter Publishing House. Alexey was born in Odessa and graduated from Donetsk State University as a teacher of Russian literature and language. His PhD uh, in theory of literature and history of Russian literature, so he is the one who definitely knows the ground. In his last publication, he explains why Europeans are so inclined to regard any evil as one side good and why this approach is sometimes wrong or even deadly wrong in his opinion. He also reviews several attempts to stop the war forever by purely philosophical tools. And in the end, let's hope to receive some recommendation for the most reasonable approach to the relations between the post-historical and the historical worlds in the foreseeable future. And Oveksi will hold a conversation with Martin Pollock, best well-known Austrian writer, journalist, and translator, a great expert in philology and history of East European countries, teaching at universities of Vienna, Warsaw, and Yugoslavia. In late 80s, he became also a contributor of German Der Spiegel News magazine and was a reporter of the magazines in Vienna and Warsaw. His main works is one way or another refer to the problems of Central or and Eastern Europe including East European Jews. And what I remember from your interview in Kyiv, what really shocked me, that was your statement that what surprised me most is that criminals were normal people. And I guess this is a big question of nowadays, how normal people became criminals or heroes. Martin, Alexey, stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the uh, first of all, I have to thank you very much for the invitation to take part in this. Uh, this is really a great honor to me. It's a great honor to speak in terrible times like this with somebody from Ukraine. 
uh, we in Austria and we in the West, of course, we know the pictures, we see the pictures, but we have really no idea what it means to live during a war. I was born in 1944, so there was still war going on. And I was in a house which was bombed. But then I was very small. I was a child, so I have no, no remembrance of this. Uh, but let me start right away with a question to Alexei. The war has shown from the very beginning that the West, that Western Europe, that free Europe, let's call it that, uh, has shown a deep misunderstanding of Russia, of Russian history and its role in Europe, and in particular of Putin and of Putin, Putin's role in Europe and of his ideas, what, Russian role, what Russians' role in Europe should be and uh, about Russian politics. So in the West, we always believed and most people in the West believed that Putin is a very normal politician, maybe an aberration in some terms, maybe a bit of a dictator, but on the whole, he's a normal guy with whom we can make business and with whom we can lead a normal dialogue. And uh, so many politicians in Austria, in Germany, but everywhere else in the free West thought that that's what we must go back again after this war or when the, or even during the war, we have to find a way to find a way to start this dialogue again. Now, do you believe that this is possible? Do you believe that the West has, because now the West seems to have changed. The, the West, the Western feelings for Ukraine, the help for Ukraine is really overwhelming. But there is, in my opinion, there is a danger that this will be short lived that after the war is over or even during the war, they will fall back into the old modes, that they will fall back into the old ways, that they will fall back to find again a dialogue with Russia, to find a dialogue with Putin's Russia. Do you think this is, this is a real danger? Well, I do. I do think there is a danger. But first of all, let me say I'm honored to meet you online. I wish we would meet in a merrier times, but you know, we are not in a position to choose the time to live in, the time chooses us to do something or not do something. And the best we can do is to react properly. And that's what we are trying to do. Uh, as to your question, indeed, there is not a single question. It's a multi-layer question, which uh, to respond very shortly, I would say, we Europeans, including Ukrainians as Europeans, should learn from the past where was the mistake, what was wrong in the, our attitude to Russia in the past, so that we would be ready not to repeat the same mistakes in the future. And here I would split the answer. It, it, it's a long story. So I would just review where would, we would look for some parts of the answer. And I would say there is a European part and the Russian part. In the European part, going back into history, there is a recent answer and a long-term answer. The recent answer is to look at the European community of steel and coal, to look at the post-war Europe as it was designed as peaceful Europe, as it was designed by Robert Schuman and Konrad Adenauer. And this was a brilliant idea. It was a huge project, very successful in, inside Europe. And this is part of the answer why European politicians are trying so stubbornly, so eagerly to find the understanding with Putin to involve him, drag him into this mode of European peaceful coexistence. This is part of the explanation in the recent history terms. A deeper explanation is uh, 
look at what Europeans mean by peaceful coexistence. And there we, we should go much deeper in history, all the way back to Grotzius, all then back to Aquinas, and finally back to Plato, to understand what is in, uh, in the deep roots of European culture, or Western culture, what is the deepest understanding of what is good and what is evil, and how to transform evil into good and how to deal with evil, how to understand it and correct it. This is one part. Of, I, I'm not giving you the answer. I'm just trying to mark where we should look for this part of the answer. And another big part is the Russian part. And here, starting from the bottom, I would say the deep misunderstanding, which I tried to explain to my Western colleagues before the war and mostly was met with smiles, I, uh, my uh, claim was that Russia is not a European country, does not belong to so-called European concert, despite visibility, despite all you can say about Russian music, Russian literature, Russian architecture, all these relations between Russian and Euro Western European and Central European culture, Russian as a state is not European. I am ready to prove it starting, but to prove it with do need some cultural studies to understand what we mean by culture. When we speak about Russian culture, it's not just music. It's not just architecture and literature. It's much more multidimensional phenomenon, Russian culture, including political culture. And uh, then uh, I add to this some Russian history. This is one part of my answer, my claim. And another part would be that the most recent misunderstanding was regarding Russian Federation after the breakup of the Soviet Union. So most Europeans believed it's a, just a new country, a national community, nation state, as well as any European state, and we should deal with it as a newcomer into our European family. In fact, I would claim, just a claim with no explanation so far, I would claim that Russian Federation is the same country as the Soviet Union, as Soviet Union is the reincarnation of Russian empire. It is still the same country, it is still empire. Soviet Union was an empire that inherited all uh, the lands, almost all the lands of uh, Russian empire. And now Russian Federation is still an empire. As Lenin called the Russian empire in 1918, a prison of nations. Russian Federation is still a prison of nations mm -hmm. and is, Moreover, it is less European than ever before, because after 1991, Russian Empire lost the most European parts of its subordinates. Europe, uh, Ukrainians, Baltic countries, and the remaining part is less European than ever before in Russian elites. And so the result is Russia now is trying to get back their imperial territories to restore itself as a stronger empire as it is, because that's an, uh, the only thing the empire can do. The question for Putin is to either lose more lands, starting from Caucasus, okay. from Chechnya, or grab more lands. And he is trying to save his empire by grabbing the lands. So this is the survey. And which part you would like to pick up for more detail at screening, that's up to you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, I think one at the roots of this whole conflict, at least from the Western perspective, is also a deep misunderstanding or a lack of understanding what Ukraine means, what Ukraine is. The same goes for Belarus. You know, in the West, we have never really understood, or many, most people never understood that Ukraine is an independent country that I'd only recently, you know, a few days ago, a friend of mine, an intellectual, Austrian intellectual, he asked me, is Ukraine really a country, a separate country? Is Ukrainian really a language? I said, <laughs> yes, of course it is. And it always has been. But you know, there is this deep misunderstanding here in the West. And that's why many people tend to say, oh, okay, Putin, maybe his methods are not so nice. But 
he's taken back what belongs to him. You know, I mean, Ukraine, after all, is some some in between. You know, it's and it really should be there. Mm-hmm. You know, and and uh, our role as intellectuals, as authors, as translators. I'm not a translator of Ukrainian literature, but of Polish literature. But it has been for many many years. You know, to point out the beauty of, for instance. Ukrainian literature of, for instance, Belarusian literature, you know, and this was this is still a surprise for many people here. You know, there's this huge misunderstanding. They don't they don't think, you know, and then they think, well, uh, Andrei Kurkov, he's writing Russian, so he must be a Russian author. You know, he must be a Russian. You know, so I say, but look, I mean, we never would call a Swiss author who is writing French, we wouldn't call him French. We don't call an Austrian author who is writing German. We don't want to be called Germans. We are not. We are Austrians. So this is a normal thing in Europe. I mean, we are multicultural. And it's normal that a country like Belarus or or Ukraine or Austria or Swiss, Switzerland, they are multilingual. But you know, there's still a lack of misunderstanding of, of understanding for this. And so I think, and, and my Ukrainian friends did for many, many years, did a huge job, a beautiful job to explain this to us. But this is taking a long, long time, you know. And I'm not so optimistic that, that this is really working very well. You know, when I look around here now in Austria or in the other Western countries, you know, I still find this lack of understanding, you know. And now my question to you is, what can we do about this? We, Austrians, Germans, French, English, American intellectuals, like Marcy Shore, like Tim Snyder, you, you all know them. Yes, I know Tim. Uh, well, uh, the best things we could do probably is to translate and publish in European languages some books of European uh, of Ukrainian historians who could tell about Ukrainian history not from Russian eyes because mostly Europeans know about Ukraine what Russian can tell exactly. to Europeans now Europeans let, let the uh, like uh, Gayatri Spivak uh, said let the subaltern speak for himself or herself. Let the Ukrainians speak for themselves. Exactly. And not only in terms of literature, it's a very good, uh, very good idea to translate more Ukrainian literature. But also we could start from Ukrainian history and show that Ukrainian community, you know, it's a mirroring. Uh, uh, the problem is like a mirror of misunderstanding of Russia. Russia is a huge country with no national community. It has it. This empire has subordinates, but not a nation state. It, it's a long of folks uh, melting in this melting pot of Russian empire. Ukraine, Ukrainians were a stateless nation for centuries. The thing is, which is very understandable for German, uh, German speaking people, for example. It was a long time uh, period in German history when Germans felt a stateless nation. The Ukrainians uh, got their state only recently, but their traditions of political culture, their traditions of local self-governance were going out for centuries and very different from Russia. Russia never had such a tradition of Magdeburg uh, law in Ukrainian cities. Russian was never part of Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth with its traditions of legal culture, of political culture which are deeply rooted in Ukrainian today, in Ukrainians' attitude to Ukrainian state, we can see that. Russia had very different religious culture, not like Ukrainians with different kind of Christianity, with different attitude to different kinds of Christianity coexisting at the same territory, like Orthodox, Catholic, Greek, uh, Orthodox Catholic, Catholic churches, Protestant churches. Ukraine is the most multi-confessional country in Europe. And this is very special mode of coexistence in terms of religious culture, also unknown to Russia at all. 
So Ukraine has a very distinctive cultural basis in many dimensions, including artistic culture, legal culture, political culture, traditions, folk culture, ethnic origins, local governance, all this taken together gives us a very distinctive picture, which is not like Russian in any important respect. Yeah, this is a huge challenge for us, really. There's, as an Austrian, you know, I feel ashamed because, as you know very well, part of today's Ukraine used to be Austrian. I mean, used to be part of the Habsburg Empire, Galicia. I'm a specialist on Galicia. I've published a lot on Galicia. And I was still amazed how little Austrians know or how little Austrians want to know about this history of ours, you know, that this is our history, you know, we are connected to these people. This is our history. Lviv, Lemberg, Lvov, Lvov was an Austrian city in a certain extent. Of course, it was always Ukrainian, it was always Polish. So it was a melting pot in itself. Galicia was a melting pot in itself. And that was very good. That's why it had such a rich culture and such a huge influence, cultural influence on Austria, on Germany. You know, many, many authors come from Galicia, many more than, than this small and very poor country uh, really should have brought up, but they did, you know. And then we look with admiration. When we know the history of Galicia, we look at with admiration at it. And we look at the admiration what Ukraine did to find its own identity, to find its own culture, to find its own uh, role in Europe. And that's why we know, and I was always sure of this, that Ukraine belongs to Europe and not to the Russian part of the world. And this we have to tell our people, this we have to convince our politicians and they are really blind, you know, and one of the reasons why they're blind is pure greed, you know, they just want to make business, you know, they envy the oligarchs, the Russian oligarchs, Deripaska, Abramovich, you know, you name them, they envy them, their palaces, their yachts, you know, their wealth, their millions and billions of dollars and, and euros and pounds. And they want to have a little part of this. You know, in Austria, we have hundreds and thousands of Russians buying land here, buying chalets, buying penthouses, buying villas, you know, and so on. And we have been living very comfortably with this, you know, and now is really at the time of the truth, you know, that all of a sudden now we see that we are dependent on Russia, we are dependent on Russian gas. And we did this deliberately, you know, Austria could have done 20 years ago. It could have done something about this, but no, it didn't. Now we are dependent, 80% of our gas comes from Russia, you know. And so I hope, I just hope that this war is really some kind of a watershed, you know, that this war should be or could be a turning point. But on the other hand, I'm not too optimistic about this. Yeah, I would say it was a strange mixture of idealism and greediness in this attitude to Russia. Because on the other, on the one hand, it's very profitable to have a friendly relations with Russia, and on the other hand, you can uh, believe, or you, or at least you could try to believe that you involve Russia in the, this European concert of nations. And this would be the best guarantee that Russia would remain peaceful. They behave badly sometimes, but well, uh, we are teaching them. We are trying to show them that to trade is much better than to fight, that they don't need war. This was the dominating attitude, for example, for Angela Merkel, as far as I understand. And where, where it was mistaken, it was mistaken. Uh, I'm going back now to the uh, claim of uh, Russian imperialism. 
it was mistaken in one very important dimension to start with. When you try to uh, create a liberal democracy in Russia, it clashes with Russian imperialistic statehood. Yeah. That's the point. Uh, look at Yeltsin's time. In the 1990s, Yeltsin tried, sincerely tried to uh, liberalize Russian economy, to build a capitalism in Russia, state controlled by still some kind of private capitalism and mix it with some liberalism. Yeltsin said to Russian regions once, get as much sovereignty as you can uh, engorge, you can swallow. So what happened? It happened that by the end of Yeltsin's rule, Moscow started to lose control over Russian territories, not yeah. only Chechnya. Tatarstan wanted equal relations with Moscow and uh, uh, was preparing to claim state, state independence. Russians living in Ural mountains wanted to create Ural Republic. In Siberia, they wanted to create Siberian Republic. I remember clearly these political projects not to speak about Caucasus. So when Putin in 1999 started his presidential campaign, this is, was his starting point. We are losing Russia. Russia is, Russian regions are running away from us in different directions, so we must do something. The imperial center was angry, was disturbed. And that is why Putin started from uh, liberating Chechnya from all nationalists who wanted to leave, the, leave Russia and claim the independent Chechen statehood. So for Putin to recapture Chechnya was the starting point of restoring control inside Russia. And then if Chechens are Russians, okay, why not Ukrainians are Russians? Yeah, of course. And on the other hand, if he would, uh, why Putin cannot admit that Ukrainians are a separate nation? Because he is thinking the world not as it is, but as it should be for Russian empire to have a future. And from this perspective, if he would admit that Ukrainians are a separate people deserving to have a separate state, why not Tatars? Why not Chechens? Why not Dagestan, Bashkortostan? And you name them, all yeah. the way to Yakutia. This was yes. the question, uh, and this was the clash overlooked by Western politicians. They wanted to see liberal Russia with more or less democratic liberal economy. And the price for this liberalism was the further disintegration of Russian imperialistic statehood. Yeah. It was too big price for Kremlin to pay. And this was, that's why Kremlin started to wrap up liberalism, to restore authoritarianism, and now is going all the way back to Nazi. Because this is the only preservation for this imperial state. That would, my, would be my explanation. Yeah, I think but now we, can, we should see it clearly. Yeah. One of the misconcepts I think in the West was that many people thought that uh, with business, we could civilize Russia and we could civilize Mr. Putin, you know, we could make him one of ours, you know, a normal businessman who has his interests, you know, in the focus. Mm -hmm. But we, I think we must understand that this is not everything he's thinking about, or this is not the main purpose he's thinking about, but he is really, after all, He's an imperialist, he's a dictator, and he's not so much. I mean, he's interested in business. He's making business. Of course, he wants, he likes money. Let's face it. I just read today that they, they in Italy, I think they confiscated a yacht which belongs to Putin, a huge boat, you know, huge. So, I mean, he's he likes his wealth and he likes luxury, no doubt about it, but, I think in the end, he is really an imperialist. And in the end, he wants to destroy free Europe and he wants to split free Europe. And this has always been his game, his, his aim. And that's what he's really mainly interested in. 
Yes, I would say I only add that this is not about Putin personally. This is yeah. about the group of politicians yeah, which of selected course. Putin as their leader. And the question, uh, I, I would put it like this. In the world uh, controlled by Western rules, Russian empire has no future. To have future, Russia has to redesign the world order and to look at, uh, make it look more like Huntington style, a clash of civilization and the remaking of the world order. Huntington was one of the favorite writers for Alexander Dugin, a theoretician yeah. in Moscow. And mm -hmm. Dugin is very popular in Kremlin. So my claim here would be that what happens now in Ukraine is uh, the question for world history now uh, deciding in Ukraine is whether the 10th, 21st century we're going to live in will be the century of Huntington or the century of Fukuyama. Yeah. On the other hand, clash of civilizations and every civilization in Russia certainly uh, feels itself a separate civilization. Every civilization writes a moral code for itself. No civilization can dictate moral code to others. So this is our territory. This is your territory. Ukraine is our territory, Russian. Don't touch it. It's, it's Russian. We claim it's ours. And then you can do whatever you like in your territory, but we are enemies naturally. Our purpose is uh, it's a zero sum game. It's not win win. We are the better off than you are worse off. This is what uh, the picture Putin tries to establish. And the only alternative is the Fukuyama style future, the future where country obey one uh, common order, obey law respect human dignity, respect nation's right to self-defense uh, and self-organization. So the Ukrainians are now defending the Fukuyama style future mm -hmm. against the Huntington style future. And that is why West should help Ukraine in whatever means possible. Is the, uh, the future of the West is at stake. The future of human civilization is at stake now in Ukraine. Well, I have the impression that Putin really doesn't understand what cooperation means. I mean, this doesn't mean anything for him. This is foreign for him. The only thing he understands apparently is really a friend and enemy scheme. Either you are my friend or you are my enemy. And he needs enemies, apparently. Russia needs enemies. Russia needs uh, to be surrounded by enemies to fight back and to have this fighting spirit and to have uh, the West as the foe and the West as the big enemy and and immoral and and whatever. So to keep the people there under under his under his reign. And so I think it is very difficult or even impossible to find a dialogue with this. I mean we have we have really to, to stand, and I, I'm afraid that he's only understanding might. He's only understanding strength. And that's what well, the it, West didn't show in the, in, the, in the past. In Putin's logic, I would say, indeed, the peaceful dialogue doesn't work. It's only a cover. The same way as European artistic culture and European style religion, uh, inherited from uh, Eastern Europe, Christianity, Orthodox Christianity is a cover of non-European statehood. It's just a cover. So I don't believe, actually, it's a strong claim, but very sincere for me, I don't believe in peaceful dialogue with Russia as long as Russia remains its, its current border. Just because it, to keep it, this geographical space under a single control from Moscow, it needs to be authoritarian. It needs to be hostile to the rest of the world. If Russia would become again more peaceful and liberal in its internal policy, the story of late Yeltsin's rule would repeat again. Yeah. Russian regions would want again to get back to their project of independent statehood. That is why Kremlin cannot afford 
not to be authoritarian. And how could you have a dialogue with this evil empire? Evil because evil, evil tools, evil political uh, means is the only way to keep the state under control. That's why the dialogue with this Russia is impossible. I would say the best future for Russia is to be reconstructed as a sort of commonwealth in, of independent states. Mm. The same story has happened with the Soviet Union, hopefully peacefully. But I would claim that this is what the world would try to do with Russia in the foreseeable future. Russia cannot be not hostile as it stands now. Yeah, we have to reconsider its political order inside Russia. You know, I myself understand this kind of thinking a little uh, because I come from a Nazi family, you know. Every right. member in my family was a hardcore Nazi. My father was in the Gestapo, my father was in the SS. He was a war criminal. And, you know, it was exactly the same thinking that we are surrounded by enemies. We have to defend ourselves and also what we are witnessing now in the war, you know, is this change from victim and perpetrator, you know, the victim, uh, the perpetrator be pretends that he's the real victim, you know, it was exactly the same in my family, I was brought up in this thinking, and I was brought up in this logic, you know. It was not the Jews who were the victims. It was it was not the Poles, not the Ukrainians, not the Russians. No, it was us. You know, we were the true victims. You know, so I was brought up until I was fourteen or sixteen in this kind of thinking, and this is exactly what I find now. You know that Russia says, "Well, we have to uh, to destroy the Nazis in Ukraine." I mean. I know the Ukraine fairly well. I mean, maybe there are some Nazis, there are some right-wing people. No doubt, they are everywhere. Many more in Austria, I know that. Many more in Germany, many more in France. No doubt about it. In Poland, we know them, you know. But this is the, the kind of logic Putin now is using. And he says, now we have to destroy the Nazis in Ukraine and we are the victims of a new genocide, you know, in in the Donbass and God knows where. I mean, this is rubbish. But many people, even in Austria or in other countries, uh, they want to believe it, you know, because they think that after all, Russia without Ukraine is not real a, a full country. Ukraine belongs to Russia. They believe this logic of, of what Putin is telling us or has been telling us for many, many years, you know, that Russia, uh, Ukraine is part of, of Russia and it's not an independent country, no independent culture, no real language and so on. So I think this thinking goes back, I mean, not, not even Nazi times, but uh, much further, of course, but we should know this. You know, but because we have lived through this, and I've lived through this because I was brought up in this in this kind of thinking. So I can at least try to imagine what's going on in Russia, what's going on in Russian heads, you know, because that was what my parents thought, that's what my grandparents thought, that's what my grandparents taught me, you know. And I had a hard time uh to get away from this. You know, it's not so easy because you're brought up uh, by people and they're loving people, they're loving parents, they're loving grandparents. At the same time, they're monsters, you know, and we have to understand this, you know. They can be, and that must be true also in Russia. They're nice people, they're nice fathers, they're nice lovers and so on. But at the same time, they become monsters in a war. And there's, it's, it's only a moment when people can switch, you know, and we must understand that. We, we cannot think that they're monsters from the beginning. No, they'd be normal people. And they're still, when they come back from the war, they become normal people again. And this 
is what makes makes this so terrible for me, you know, because mm -hmm. I've witnessed it in a in a certain sense myself. Well, as to Russians, they indeed are blind and they are trying to persuade uh, the Ukrainians, look, we are the same people. They are still believed that they are told some, for so many years, we are the same people. When they ask Ukrainians and Ukrainians disagree, Russian becomes uh, become angry. And now you uh, ask uh, to reply to Austrian or Western people, Western intellectuals who believe the same Russian story. I would say that now Ukrainians are paying the highest price to prove a different position. Ukrainians now are dying for their right not to be Russians. Exactly. What else do you need to prove that there are distinct people they don't want? Ask Ukrainians, not, don't ask Russians who are Ukrainians. Ask Ukrainians and we'll tell you, and we'll tell you that we will defend our freedom by the price of our lives, but we'll not be Russians. Russia, Putin expected uh, that will be as with part of population of in Crimea back eight years ago. It's not the same story. Nobody will greet uh, would greet Putin. Nobody greeted Putin in the first days of the war, and still people are trying to resist by whatever means they can. And this is the best proof that Ukraine is not Russia. And in fact. I would even uh, I would uh, add one more claim. I would say that Russian uh, Putin came to Ukraine to destroy U Ukrainian uh, national identity. In fact, he is destroying the, the remains of the Russian world in Ukraine. Because there will be no toleration to Russian world in Ukraine after this war. Putin cannot destroy Ukrainian nation as such, as our president said several years ago to obey Putin, to do what he wants, we have to die. He should kill us first, and then we would comply to his claims. So that is why Ukrainian will win this war in the first place. You, cannot de you can destroy all nations. And after this war, there will be no remains of Russian world in Ukraine. No Russian music, popular music, no Soviet movies, which are actually Russian movies, no Russian propaganda. This toleration is old. People in Ukraine had actually also a lot of illusions about Russia, as well as in Austria, as well as in Central and Eastern Europe for years. But now it's all over, game over. Now it will be another future for Ukraine, another history, and hopefully for Europe as well. Yeah, and this, I think, in this sense, we should be very grateful to Ukraine because Ukraine is opening our eyes for the reality. And the reality has always been like this, but we just didn't want to believe it. We didn't want to see it. And this is our mistake. And that's why we should be very, very grateful and thankful, you know, for Ukrainians, because as you say, Ukrainians are dying for the freedom. We are not dying for your freedom. You know, it's not like the Polish saying goes, for your and our freedom, you know, Savasho and Nashon Wolnosht. No, we are sitting here very comfortably. You know, we're eating good food. I'm going to tend my garden tomorrow, you know, but I never stopped thinking about Ukraine. And I think this is very, very important. And so, in the end, I'm a bit optimistic about the whole situation. I know this is very comfortable for me to think in terms of optimism when I'm looking at Ukraine where people, where children, where women are killed, being killed senselessly and very cruelly by Russian soldiers, by Russian generals, and by Putin, who is ordering all these bombardments and, and everything. Uh, but we must understand that Ukraine is fighting for our freedom also, not only for their freedom, but also for European freedom. Ukraine is fighting and Ukrainians are dying for our democracy, for democracy as such. 
And therefore, I think we must never forget what Ukrainians are going through. Now, there's one last question I have to you. You are a philosopher. And I think you're contemplating also the problem of the philosopher and the war. Can you tell me something, enlighten me, what this means for you or what what we have, what we can understand them as, you know, oh, your role as a philosopher in this war? That would be a good question for another conversation about <laughs> okay. 40 minutes or more. <laughs> I'm I could sorry. only say that I started thinking about it when the war in the Eastern Ukraine started. And I wrote a piece in 1914, uh, named Philosopher and War, when I tried to review that there's a lot of example came to my mind start, starting from Voltaire Candide or at the beginning of this story Candide happens to be in the battlefield and Voltaire says that what did he do he didn't fight Candide qui tremblait common philosophe se cacha de mieux qu'il put pendant sa boucherie héroïque Candide trembling as a philosopher tried to hide as best that he could during this heroic butcher. So why, why it is so? Uh, why philosopher is, uh, why Voltaire thinks that philosopher is, uh, ha has a right to some exempt status? For what? This was the question also for Wittgenstein, who came to war uh, deliberately, and he started his philosophy in times of war. Yeah. So there is a deep relation between philosopher and war, and one of the answers why philosopher should hide and stay alive is to find some way to stop the war and to prevent the next war. And that's actually all our conversation today was about it. What we should learn from our past, what should be the lessons from the past, what, was the, what were the mistakes that would help us to stop this war and never had this war again. This is a part of the homework philosophers are doing as well as historians, politologists, specialists in cultural studies, translators, writers. Actually, that's uh, uh, part of what we were doing today, Martin. And thank you for this conversation. I that's thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Martin, for your, I'm pretty sure for some of Ukrainians kind of eyes opening perspective of the best optics and also for explanation on some mechanism of friends, enemies, and cooperation, as well as meaning of strength for Nazi-like thinking. Thank you, Alexei, for your philosophical and deep historical and cultural approach and your thoughts on possibility of these conditions for dialogue and a place of philosopher on the war. Thank you both for the discussion on values, better understanding on how Russia thinks and the geopolitical angle for a lot of strong things said here. What we can take from this conversation is deeper understanding and some answers about what can I, as an intellectual, do to, have you, to help Ukraine today. And today I would say learn, understand, and acknowledge to fix the mistakes. We are grateful to our partners for today's event. First of all, Goethe Institute Ukraine, Pan America, the Ukrainian Institute, the Ukrainian Institute London, Ukraine World, the Harvard University, Ukrainian Research Institute and the Harman Institute at Columbia University, and for all the cross streaming services on all the partners' pages. Gratitude, of course, to Pan Ukraine, which continues to stand at the front lines in the name of freedom and truth. Pan International is proud to be a platform that supports freedom of expression. We don't always agree with each word said, but this is how freedom of expression works. And this is one of the biggest fights which is happening in Ukraine and Russia right now. Please follow our page to be informed about further events over the next week. The next episode will be broadcast on Friday, 25th of March at 5 p.m. Kyiv time, 3 p.m. London time. Our guests for Friday are Natalia Snyadanko, Ukrainian writer, journalist, and translator, Joseph Conrad Literary Award winner. She will hold her dialogue with Margaret Atwood, Canadian writer, best known for her prose fiction and for strong feminist perspective. 
thank you, our great speakers. Thank you one more time for acknowledging our invitation. Thank you, our viewers. Follow our dialogues on war, share the stream, spread the word, and stand with Ukraine. This is our shared responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.